Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Irene Garcia-Newton. Irene is a professor in the Department of Biology at Indiana University, Bloomington. Irene is a microbiologist and is interested in host microbe interactions. Today we'll hear about her research on Wolbachia and its influence on the ability of some infected mosquitoes to serve as hosts to arboviruses. Irene has also been investigating microbe host interactions in honeybees and also the evolutionary genomics of intracellular bacteria such as Yersinia and Rhizobia. Irene, it's great to have you as a participant in our webinar program and in this series on Wolbachia. At this point, I'd like to turn things over to you. Everybody's attention um, this morning before Thanksgiving. Um, I'll tell you how my lab has been trying to get at the mechanism of Wolbachia-mediated virus inhibition. And I want to start out by pointing out that this work wouldn't have been possible without an amazing collaborative team. So I've been a longtime collaborator of Dr. Rich Hardy here at Indiana University. He's an alpha virus uh, biologist. Um, and we uh, collaboratively mentor two amazing trainees, uh, Dr. Amelia Lindsay, who is now a faculty member at Minnesota, and Dr. Tamnash Bhattacharya, who is now a postdoctoral fellow at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And really, our work has been uh, to develop a model system where we can really dissect exactly what Wolbachia is doing to the host cell and what virus is doing to the host cell and how these processes impinge upon each other using the model systems of Drosophila melanogaster, of course, and the powerful genetics in that system, as well as the model alpha virus, Synbis. I don't need to convince anybody here that RNA viruses are really important. I think that, you know, we're, we're just coming out of this SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, it's really evident the amount of damage that these tiny genomes can inflict upon our health and our economies. But arboviruses, viruses that are transmitted by arthropods, are really important group of RNA viruses. And there are few vaccines and other therapeutics. And generally, people focus on control of the insect vector itself. The alpha viruses we work on are one class of arboviruses, and there are two major arbovirus families, of uh, flaviviruses being the others. And they um, are found in vectors such as AD species. Now, these viruses normally undergo a zoonotic cycle where they're being transmitted um, in these wild mammalian populations to mosquitoes, through mosquitoes. But there can generally be accidental spillover effects into human populations, and we'll see an urban cycle develop. I'm going to highlight a little background on the symbiont that we love in our lab, Wolbachia, for those of you who hadn't had a chance to look at or uh, be present for the other webinars. So Wolbachia pipientis is an obligately intracellular microbe within the Rickettsiales group. It infects 40 to 60 percent of all insect species. And it's highlighted here in this phylogeny that was recently published. Um, Wolbachia infect a huge array of insect orders. So the different colors here on the tree correspond to different insect orders as do the little shapes of uh, kind of these insect schematics that they put next to them or these arthropod schematics, I should say. Um, Wolbachia also infect filarial nematodes, and so they really are a really prevalent group of intracellular microbes on the planet. And they're maternally transmitted. And I'm showing you here a uh, electro, uh, sorry, a, a fluorescent micrograph of Wolbachia infecting the germarium of Drosophila melanogaster. So this is the very earliest stage of oogenesis where the egg is being formed, the generation of the, the next generation. And Wolbachia have figured out a way to target this tissue, tissue and colonize at really high numbers. Every one of these little green puncta is a Wolbachia cell. So this is a heavily infected uh, tissue. But if I were to dissect you know, infected and uninfected flies, ovaries and show them to you, there would be no morphological defects. So it's really highlighting the fact that Wolbachia have really figured out clever strategies to control cell biology. And by targeting early stages of oogenesis, they really ensure their maternal transmission. Although, as you heard from Brandon Cooper, they are also famous for horizontal transmission, their ability to rapidly spread between insect populations and colonize new species via uh, some kind of, of horizontal transfer, be that some parasite interaction or prey-predator interaction. And Wolbachia is also famous for modifying the host cell environment, including host reproduction. So you heard, heard from Rupinder how Wolbachia uh, 
the mechanisms by which Wolbachia induces cytoplasmic incompatibility. Uh, but in order to just exist as an intracellular entity in a host cell, Wolbachia have to modify all sorts of host cellular processes, right? Um, having a bacterium living inside of a eukaryotic cell is not normal. And so Wolbachia uses its type 4 secretion system and its secreted proteins to be able to change and sculpt the cellular environment um, in order to um, persist and to replicate and be maternally transmitted. These modifications include things like inducing ER stress and reactive oxygen species production, uh, priming the immune system, altering the cytoskeleton and uh, membrane trafficking, as well as lipid biosynthesis. Any one of these processes you can imagine would be something that would uh, alter the way a virus replicates inside of these cells. And so let's get to that, you know, specifically. So Wolbachia was first um, shown to inhibit virus replication in Drosophila melanogaster in two papers that came out side by side from uh, Teixeira and Hedges in 2008. In both of these papers, they showed that the Wolbachia um, passed down through the maternal line was able to protect these insects from Drosophila C virus, which is a, a virus that would kill the insect um, early on. So as you see on the left, when you have flies that do not carry the Wolbachia, shown in light gray, then they die more early than flies that carry the Wolbachia. So Wolbachia was shown to provide uh, a resistance and tolerance to these viral infections. And importantly, in the Teixeira paper, they also showed that the genome of the virus mattered, that the DNA viruses were not protected against, Wolbachia was not protective against DNA viruses, whereas RNA viruses it was. And so uh, Wolbachia has been used now as a tool to try to limit the spread of these RNA viruses in the environment. The idea that you could transfer Wolbachia from Melanogaster, um, having this protective effect into Aedes aegypti, um, and then release these mosquitoes into populations. If these mosquitoes would take a blood meal from a person infected with dengue, for example, then that dengue can't replicate in the mosquito. When it takes a second blood meal, it doesn't transmit the disease. And of course, the World Mosquito Program uh, has successfully implemented this throughout many parts of the world. And this is, I think, now an outdated probably diagram of different places in the world where they have deployed um, Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. And we have evidence, and you probably heard from the first webinar, that Wolbachia releases are successful in reducing the incidence of dengue um, in, in some uh, areas where we have multiple seasons of data. So as I mentioned, this type of inhibition seems to be associated with the virus genome type. And we know that uh, in our laboratory, we have studied native associations. So that is different strains of Wolbachia that infect Drosophila melanogaster, such as WMEL and WMEL pop, uh, strains of Wolbachia that infect Aedes albopictus, like WLA or WLB. And we have seen that viruses that are susceptible to Wolbachia inhibition include viruses of many different families. So the Togaviridae, Flaviviridae, and Desistaviridae families, these are all positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses. Whereas non-susceptible viruses include viruses with different genomes, such as negative sense single-stranded RNA viruses or DNA viruses. And so this, you know, kind of theme of the genome being important is going to come up later in the talk. And so I just want to keep it on top of mind for y'all now. Um, so for example, uh, in my lab, we've shown that this inhibition can be detected very early on as a change in viral RNA genome. So when an insect cell or the whole insect has Wolbachia present, um, we can see less virus genome replication. Um, so it limits the ability of the virus to initiate genome replication in the first earliest stages of the viral cell cycle. We also see the same type of protection in non-native trans infections. Obviously, this is how Wolbachia has become uh, deployed by the World Mosquito Program and others. So the WLB from Aedes albopictus, for example, uh, can be injected into Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, creating this trans-infected um, population. And we also see that the amount of RNA present, the viral RNA present in these mosquitoes with Wolbachia present is reduced compared to uh, uninfected mosquitoes. Again, this genome replication defect. So this is the outline of the rest of my talk I will tell you about today. So first, um, basically getting at exactly what are the, what's the mechanism by which Wolbachia is limiting viruses. So first we'll talk about what it is what do we mean by pathogen blocking? What are What is it that we observe when we talk about pathogen blocking? And how might Wolbachia actually be doing it? All right, so here's a uh, schematic of an arthropod cell. The virus has to be able to get into the cell 
be internalized, and then its genome is dumped into the cytosol. Now, these single-stranded uh, positive sense viruses, these genomes resemble mRNAs. So they, uh, for Simbus, they have a cap and a poly A tail. And so if you plunk these genomes inside of a arthropod or a mammalian cell, they initiate infection um, using the cellular machinery just on their own. And so they'll use your, your ribosomes, uh, for example, to make their non-structural proteins that then make more genome, that also make more of the structural proteins to create the capsid that will encapsulate the viral genome and then lead to these particles being released from the cell. So this is kind of a schematic representation of the virus life cycle. What happens when Wolbachia is present? We've shown that the genome of the virus, as soon as it enters the cell, is rapidly degraded and degraded much more quickly in the presence of Wolbachia. So the half-life of the viral genome we see is reduced. And so here in, in this uh, graph, when in mosquito cells or in fly cells, you have Wolbachia present, <clears throat> you have about a half reduction, <clears throat> excuse me, of the half-life of the virus. So it sticks around for half as long. So the genome itself that is coming into the cellular environment just can't stick around as long. So it can't be acted upon by the ribosomes to create more viral protein, to create more genome. We also see a decrease in viral genome replication overall. So if we look in a Wolbachia-infected context, and so that is in red here in this graph, um, versus a Wolbachia-free context in blue, over time, you see that the amount of viral RNA that is reproduced in the cell increases when Wolbachia is absent. But in the presence of Wolbachia, it decreases. So we have a defect in viral replication. And so the earliest stages of establishing this uh, viral infection are abrogated by Wolbachia. We also know that the progeny virions that are produced in the context of a Wolbachia infected cell have reduced infectivity. So what do I, I mean by that? So all of the progeny viruses that come out of this cell, some of them are infectious and some of them are not. And that's just the norm for um, the, these, these infections. So these viruses, the viruses that are coming out, you can count the total number of them and then you can count the infectious particles by counting plaques. And with that ratio, we can get at specific infectivity. And Wolbachia really alters the spe specific infectivity of the viruses, reducing the number, the proportion of that population that can initiate a new round of infection. And showing you in the schematic here that without Wolbachia present, you have about 60% of these virions able to form an, a new infection in mammalian cells or mosquito cells. Without Wolbachia or with Wolbachia present, in the presence of Wolbachia, we do see a reduction in total particles, but we also see a really massive reduction in infectious particles with just 1% of that population being able to go on and form an infection. So all of these different ways um, that Wolbachia's presence impinges upon the viral life cycle make it a very robust mechanism to use for pathogen blocking. So this uh, specific infectivity defect that we observed and these defects in genome replication may be us really interested in understanding how Wolbachia alters the viral genome in order to initiate this reduction in specific infectivity. We know that this phenotype we observe is independent of virus, Wolbachia, and host association, that it's common. So we have tested it in flies and in mosquitoes using four different alphaviruses and a flavivirus. And I'll show you those data now. So that specific infectivity ratio in the presence of Wolbachia is reduced in flies, in the presence of Simbus, in the presence of chikungunya virus, in the presence of Zika virus. So we see a significant reduction in these infectious particles with three different viruses from two different families. We also see the same is true for Wolbachia infected mosquitoes. We see a drop in specific infectivity across these same three viruses. Now you can ask, do multiple Wolbachia strains do this? And the answer is yes. Here we have mosquito cells infected with three different Wolbachia strains, WML, from Melanogaster, WLB from Aedes albopictus, and W. stri from a leafhopper. And in each case, we see this drop in specific infectivity. So this suggests to us that this reduction in infectious variants is a common phenotype for Wolbachia that block pathogens. So what causes this reduced virus infectivity? What's the reason that we see the progeny variants coming out of these infections as not being able to initiate a new round of infection. 
We can take progeny viruses from Wolbachia infected or uninfected mosquito cells, and then we can apply them to naive vertebrate cells and watch the infection proceed using a luciferase reporter construct. And what you can see in this graph is over time, the number of these light units, so this proxy for an increase in if infection, the amount of luciferase produced, increases in a Wolbachia infected um, when the when the uh, when the cells are derived from Wolbachia free, so in blue, um, mosquito cells. But when they are derived from Wolbachia infected mosquito cells, we see a reduction over time. And now you could say, wait, that's just pathogen blocking. But I'll remind you that there is no Wolbachia in this assay. We have isolated viruses from Wolbachia free or Wolbachia infected mosquito cells and then applied them to BHK cells. So there's something, some kind of epigenetic signature, something that these virions remember from the environment in which they were reared. So that the virions coming from a Wolbachia infected mosquito cell now don't replicate as well in BHK cells compared to the virions coming from Wolbachia free mosquito cells. So we wondered if the defect was because maybe these viruses can't get into our vertebrate cells. One way to be able to ask this question is to take those progeny viruses and extract the virion RNA and transfect it into BHK cells. So we're bypassing entry. And as I mentioned before, these virions uh, genomes are essentially mRNAs and they will initiate a round of infection on their own. And when we do this, we actually see that the phenotype gets worse. The genomes of viruses that were reared in the presence of Wolbachia don't initiate an infection upon transfection into mammalian cells. Um, that's what you see in red here on the right over time compared to the virions from that were reared in a Wolbachia-free context. So the genome, there's something wrong with the genome of these viruses that are coming from a Wolbachia-infected mosquito context. So that uh, segment that, we, um, that I just presented made us conclude that viral RNA is a shared target of inhibition across the Wolbachia uh, host virus combinations. Because we see commonalities in the viruses and the types of genome they have that are inhibited by Wolbachia, and because we know that somehow the virus genome is modified in the presence of Wolbachia to then become less infectious in the next generation, it suggested to us that viral RNA might be the target for Wolbachia-mediated pathogen blocking. But what does this look like at an organismal level? What does it look like when you have a mosquito taking an infected blood meal um, from a Wolbachia, or it, it has Wolbachia present in it, right? What does Wolbachia pathogen blocking look like in the whole animal? So in order for these viruses to establish infection, um, the mosquito must take a blood meal from an infected vertebrate host. The virus then has to disseminate in that infected vector, it has to be able to cross the midgut, has to be able to get to the hemolymph, and then get to the salivary glands to be able to be transmitted to a naive vertebrate host and finish that cycle of infection and transmission. So we wanted to um, mimic this process in a cell-based assay. And what we're going to be using is a combination of reporter viruses that have an MKT or fluorophore um, tagged to the virus and live cell imaging. So we're going to watch the production of this MKT fluorophore as a proxy for virus replication in different populations of cells. So to mimic stage one, where the virus has to go from a mammalian context to a mosquito context, we're going to use vertebrate cells to rear our virus and then overlay the virus onto mosquito cells with or without Wolbachia. So these will be Wolbachia minus cells um, or Wolbachia plus cells as recipients. And the producer cells will be BHK21 cells for both of these different scenarios. And this is what it looks like. Over time, 
we see an increase in virus positive cells per image, so that MK fluorophore, when these viruses are overlaid onto Wolbachia free mosquito cells. We see that Wolbachia infected cells abrogate the um, production of MK. And so this is a proxy for the fact that the virus itself is not replicating well in these Wolbachia infected mosquito cells. So this is right, pathogen blocking. This is what we've observed before and what we would expect. Wolbachia limits the replication of these viruses and their spread within the cell. What about stage two? So here the virus has to go from one infected mosquito cell to an uninfected neighboring cell. So we're going to mimic how Wolbachia might play a role in this scenario by looking at how this virus reared in Wolbachia free cells will replicate in a Wolbachia free cell comparing it to how it reared an Wolbachia-free mosquito cell would replicate in a Wolbachia-infected mosquito cell. Again, you see the same type of pathogen blocking that we saw in the mammalian context, right? Going from mammalian to mosquito. Wolbachia infection in these recipient cells limits the replication of the virus. We see fewer virus-positive cells per image over time. Now, what about if you have a Wolbachia-infected neighboring cell growing the virus, and this virus is able to then infect a cell that's next door, but doesn't have Wolbachia. Now we know that Wolbachia infects many tissues of the animal, but it infects at different densities. And we also know that Wolbachia mediated inhibition is a cell autonomous phenomenon. The cell has to be infected with Wolbachia in order to be protected from the virus. So what happens if you have a Wolbachia infected cell producing these viruses, but they're able to infect an un a Wolbachia free cell next door. And what happens if you have Wolbachia infected cells or virions produced from Wolbachia infected cells going to another Wolbachia infected cells? As you might suspect, we see this gradient of inhibition. So even for a mixed uh, population where you might have some cells with Wolbachia and some not, the presence of those Wolbachia infected cells will reduce the virion infectivity such that they can't replicate well, even if they make it to a Wolbachia free cell. And that's why we see this gradient. With the highest amount of virus replication in the Wolbachia free context, but when any of these cells, either the recipient cells or the producer cells, have Wolbachia, we see some degree of pathogen blocking. Now let's examine that final scenario. You have the infected vector, the mosquito, transmitting viruses to a naive vertebrate host. And we're going to mimic that by rearing these viruses in Wolbachia infected or Wolbachia free cells and overlaying them on VHK cells. And now the, over time, what we observe is a shift in the initiation of the infection and also in cell death. And I think you can observe this well in this uh, little movie that I have here. So you're going to be looking for the appearance of these red fluorophores, so that MK marker over time. So the number of foci and the spread of these foci in these populations. So on the left, we have Wolbachia that was derived, we have uh, viruses that were derived from Wolbachia infected mosquito cells. So the producer cells were Wolbachia infected. And on the right, we have viruses that were derived from Wolbachia free producer cells. So the mosquito cells did not have Wolbachia. And so you can see that the total amount of fluorescence and its initiation is much faster when these viruses are derived from Wolbachia free mosquitoes. All right, so as I uh, alluded to before, Wolbachia medi mediates this effect of pathogen blocking in a cell autonomous way. Wolbachia have to be inside the cells in order to abrogate the virus replication. But that doesn't mean that they don't protect neighboring cells in some way, because it, as it turns out, that the virions that are produced by Wolbachia infected cells are less infectious, right? So this reduced infectivity of progeny viruses then means that these particles produced from Wolbachia infected cells can't go on to initiate a new round of infection in a neighboring cell. And so it, it kind of protects 
uh, the rest of the animal, as well as increases the efficacy of Wolbachia mediated pathogen blocking in the whole animal. So the mosquito has to acquire the virus, it has to disseminate around the tissue, and has to be then transmitted to another vertebrate. And every step of the way, if Wolbachia is present in any one of the cells the virus encounters, you will see a decrease in the ability of the virus to replicate. Okay, so that kind of gives you a sense of the what, or what we have been looking at with regards to Wolbachia mediated inhibition. We know that Wolbachia alters the cell environment in some way, that this uh, impinges upon virus replication really early during infection. So in the earliest stages of viral genome replication and in the earliest stages of viral protein production. We know that this is specific to viruses of a certain kind of genome type. You know, that's kind of curious to us why positive sense single-stranded RNA viruses are more susceptible than others is interesting. And it's suggestive of the mechanism by which this pathogen blocking occurs. We know that there's something wrong with the virus genome when it's reared in a context in the presence of Wolbachia, and that this then has, impinges upon the virus's ability to replicate in other cellular environments. So how does Wolbachia actually do this? One way of trying to get at the host determinants involved in this inhibition is by large-scale RNA-seq. So Dr. Amelia Lindsay, when she was a postdoc in the lab, you know, took on this project, and we had this block design with and without Symbis, with and without Wolbachia, all in the same genetic background of fruit fly, asking what are the ways in which the Wolbachia infection might limit the virus. Now, you may imagine that somehow Wolbachia is acting to in directly impact the virus, that maybe Wolbachia has specific proteins that it produces that will attack the virus, right? That is that is one hypothesis, but is not one that we favor for many reasons. One is that, of course, Wolbachia's genome is quite small. It's only a megabase. And so the idea that Wolbachia would carry so many different proteins to be able to inhibit an array of completely unrelated viruses is a little far-fetched. The second reason that we don't favor this hypothesis is because the inhibition we observe is in Wolbachia virus combinations that have never seen each other before. So WML, which is a melanogaster Wolbachia, has never interacted with Symbis virus, which is found in mosquitoes, right? And is transmitted by mosquitoes. So we're kind of forcing these two to interact with each other. Um, and if Wolbachia had specific proteins in mind for Symbis, well, it would never have had the chance to evolve them. And so we much more favor the hypothesis that Wolbachia acts indirectly via the host, altering the cell environment to suit its own purposes. And as a side effect, this inhibits virus replication. So what Amelia did was she um, reared flies of the same genetic background with and without Wolbachia, with and without Symbis virus. And then she waited six, 24 and 48 hours post-injection you know, for those without Symbis, she just did a mock injection with buffer alone, extracted total RNA, and then reduced the amount of ribosome there and ran all of this on an NEB Next instrument. This is our bioinformatic workflow in the lab. So we took that raw data and ran some quality control metrics on it and then mapped it to the existing Drosophila and Wolbachia and virus genomes using RSEM, which allowed us to normalize for library size and also get at the total number of transcripts that uh, per read that you know, we, were being, we were producing, or reads per transcript that we were producing. And then this data was used um, as input with edge R to be able to calculate differential expressed genes. So what is significantly differentially expressed across these conditions across time? One big advantage of using the fruit fly is we can take advantage of what's called the string network. So the string network um, allows us to take the information that already exists in the literature for protein-protein interaction, for genetic interactions, um, for any piece of data that's out there for the fruit fly, and apply it to our differentially expressed genes so that we can then ask, are there hubs of interaction that we see in our data, are there particular processes that are similarly impacted by the presence of Wolbachia, of Symbis, or both? And so first I'm gonna give you kind of a bird's eye view of the data. So for each of these, uh, in this axis, this is, this is just a PCA plot type plot. And so you see um, each of these points 
corresponds to the median of all the replicates that we have for these data. And they are colored by condition. So in red, we have without Wolbachia and without Simbus, so just these wild type flies that have been poked. In blue, in the presence of Wolbachia, in yellow, in the presence of Simbus, and in black, in the presence of both. And the arrows are there just to guide your eye because six hours is shown as a little square, 24 hours as a circle, and 48 hours as a triangle. And what you can see, which is kind of fun, is that the flies that don't get Simbus in red and in blue here, they start out in certain transcriptional space after the poke, and then they move in certain direction, but then start to recover. So you can kind of see that transcriptionally, they're going back to the beginning through recovery. But those flies that continue to have Simbus virus, because remember, these are persistent infections in the arthropod, um, in yellow and in black here, you see that they start out in a certain transcriptional space after poking, but then they're kind of going somewhere else. They're never going to recover because the virus is still present. Now, I can also show you for these data that if you take these same data points and turn them on their axis, that they certainly do group by whether Wolbachia is present, as you can see here in blue and black, or whether Simbus is present, as you can see here in black and yellow. But the real question is, how is the fly responding to the virus and to Wolbachia, right? You're probably familiar with seeing these types of heat maps as a result of RNA-seq projects. So I'll tell you that the, the color code here is the more highly expressed, the darker the blue, and repressed genes are gonna be in this lighter yellowy color. Every one of our conditions is uh, plotted here as columns. So every one of the replicates is an individual column, and every host gene that was responsive to virus infection is shown as a row. So many host genes, are differentially expressed in response to virus. And I think what's uh, enlightening to focus on here are uh, these two columns here. So at six hours post-infection in the presence of Simbus virus, you see this massive response when Wolbachia is absent. In that central column, you see a whole bunch of genes are upregulated by the fly. If you compare that to when Wolbachia is present, we see this very muted response to, to the virus. It's almost as though the virus isn't there at all. And in fact, that isn't almost the case because Wolbachia really limits the replication of this virus. So how does Wolbachia alter the host cell environment? What are the genes that Wolbachia um, alters when it's present? Let me walk you through this very data dense figure. Every one of these nodes is a, a host gene that was differentially expressed in the presence of Wolbachia. So a host locus that responded either upregulated if it's shown in darker blue or downregulated if it's shown in yellow. If that gene has known protein-protein interactions or genetic interactions with other loci that were differentially expressed, then it has a connection drawn between it and another node. And the more connections, the larger the node will appear. Also, because you know of the data set that we have, the Drosophila transcriptome, um, and you know, kind of just the gene architecture so very well known, we were able to really pick out differential isoform usage in the presence of Wolbachia. So this symbiont not only altered the expression of these genes, but which isoforms were used, which I think is quite fascinating. It's something that the lab is working on following up. Finally, Amelia overlaid on these hubs of interaction, if you will, um, their functional similarities. So we have many genes involved in the stress response here on the left, also ubiquitin processes, the recombination cell cycle checkpoint process, RNA binding and processing, transcription and translation, and metabolism. Um, I also like to say it's, it's cute that we found these differences in uh, isoform usage and splicing, um, and we also saw a differential expression in isoform usage for proteins involved in differential isoform usage and splicing, so I think it, it goes well together. Um, probably in the other talks that you've heard as part of uh, this um, series, you've heard that Wolbachia produces a um, potent ubiquitolase that's involved in cytoplasmic incompatibility. So it was nice to see a ubiquitin node come up in our analysis as well. Now, what about the virus? So the virus also alters host gene expression. And what you can see here is the similar type of graph. So every one of these nodes is a host gene that is differentially regulated by virus. We see uh, many host processes 
um, so host genes that are involved in endoplasmic reticulum process or metabolism process. And we also see some loci that are uh, differentially spliced in the presence of virus. But really what we wanted to understand was how these two intracellular entities interact with each other. Like what is that interface like? What are genes that these uh, two different intracellular organisms are fighting over? And so we combined the networks together. In blue or in purple, you have the Wolbachia responsive network. In gray, you have the Symbus responsive network. In teal, you have interactive effects such as isoform usage. In yellow are genes that were affected by both. And I wanna focus on this gene Pratt 2 because at the interface of these two different networks, we find genes involved in nucleotide metabolism such as ADE3, rudimentary-like, and Pratt 2 so Amelia went on to test whether these loci were important for Wolbachia virus interaction using the UAS GAL4 system of flies and some resources that, that have been developed for the fruit fly that allow us to knock genes down um, endogenously. So in fruit flies, we use this GAL4 UAS system. So one line of flies will have a promoter. Of, in this case, we're gonna be using a heat shock driver that produces then a GAL4 transcription factor. And this GAL4 will bind to the upstream activating sequence of another genetic construct that produces a double-stranded RNA that targets, in this case, the Pratt 2 gene. So in our F1 progeny, where we have the presence of both the GAL4 driver, the heat shock response driver, and this UAS to uh, knock down Pratt 2, we can then test whether the knockdown of Pratt 2 has an effect on Wolbachia-mediated pathogen blocking. And these two graphs are just to show you that we can, in fact, reduce Pratt 2 if we knock down um, its expression by subjecting these flies to heat and inducing that GAL4 UAS system. So in the presence of Wolbachia here, we see a reduction in Pratt 2, um, as well as in the Wolbachia-free background. If we uh, want, we also wanted to kind of confirm that Wolbachia titer didn't change in these lines, and we did not see any significant change in Wolbachia titer um, when we subject these flies to the heat shock. So now we can ask whether the knockdown of Pratt2 influences virus replication in this context. And indeed, we saw interactive effects of Wolbachia virus and host nucleotide pathways. So here, when Wolbachia is not present, we see a knockdown of Pratt2 actually decreases viral PFUs. But when Wolbachia is present, the knockdown of Pratt2 increases viral PFUs. So it has the opposite phenotype. And this is quite interesting because the cellular environment, as you, you know from our data we've shown you, is quite different in the presence of Wolbachia and in the presence of virus. So it suggests that indeed, these nucleotide biosynthesis pathways do impinge upon the association so in conclusion for this part of the talk, Wolbachian infection results in a muted response to virus, and Wolbachian virus both modify the host cell environment at the interface of nucleotide metabolism. And so we've been mining this data set to try to identify other host determinants involved in pathogen blocking. The working hypothesis is that these genes must be differentially expressed in the presence of Wolbachia or virus or both or can be involved in pathogen blocking in both fruit flies and mosquitoes, and could exhibit red queen dynamics. And so by red queen dynamics, I mean that virus and Wolbachia and host have been on an evolutionary arms race um, to essentially uh, circumvent host, the host immune response. And so if we find uh, Wolbachia genes, host genes, or virus genes that undergo this kind of dramatic increase in diversification over time, it suggests that they might be involved in interaction with this pathogen blocking phenotype. And that brought us to this gene, uh, DNMT2. DNMT2 is an RNA methyltransferase, and it's the only methyltransferase in dipterans. It's induced following ER stress and reactive oxygen species stress, and I did tell you that Wolbachia induce both. It's known to leave these five methylcytosine marks on RNA and previously had been characterized to be important in the methylation of tRNAs in Drosophila. And so we've uh, showed in 2017 that Wolbachia actually massively increases the expression of MT2. Here on the right, you see in Wolbachia infected flies that are either mock injected or have virus, 
um, and Wolbachia free flies that are mock injected and have virus. Only the Wolbachia infected mock injected flies have increased MT2 expression. So when Wolbachia is around in a normal fly context, their MT2 is highly expressed. And you add virus, then we see this dramatic dip in MT2 expression. So it seems like this was a transcriptional hub that Wolbachia and virus were fighting over. I also wanted to point out that this is a phenomenon we see across many Wolbachia variants. So many different strains of Wolbachia of WML type in melanogaster increase MT2 in the fly. So we know uh, now that MT2 is antiviral, that it's required for virus inhibition and its function is antiviral function is independent of Wolbachia, but it phenocopies pathogen blocking. So if we flag tag DNMT2 uh, and drive its expression in Drosophila cells without Wolbachia, we see specific infectivity of the virus drop suggesting that MT2 alone can have a protective antiviral effect. We also know that the protective antiviral effect is dependent on the catalytic activity of this methyltransferase. So there's a well-known uh, conserved set of residues involved in uh, this methyltransferase activity for this gene. And so what we did is mutated that conserved uh, cysteine residue here and when we overexpress that mutant construct that now has the abrogated catalytic site, we no longer see this protective effect, suggesting that the methyltransferase activity excel itself is required for the antiviral function. So if the methyltransferase is required for the antiviral function, can we show that the methyltransferase binds the virus genome? One way to uh, answer this question is to create a flag tagged MT2 and to pull that virus genome out of the cell. So essentially asking, can we enrich for that virus genome if we pull down flag tagged MT2? So on the left, you can see we do express flag tagged MT2. Um, on the far left is our empty vector control. And if we count um, using quantitative PCR, the amount of Simbis genome that we pull down, we see an enrichment in the presence of this flag tagged MT2 compared to empty vector. So this suggests that fruit fly MT2 does bind the Simbis virus genome. But as is very evident, um, organisms, especially different species, are very different. And these two different genera are very different. Flies are not mosquitoes. There's massive differences in their physiology. It has been a lot of fun and is, I think, uh, great to take advantage of the genetic tools and flies to be able to do these large scale screens and be able to identify potential targets. But it's also really important to translate anything you find into the mosquito system. And so does mosquito MT2, for example, find the Simbis virus genome? We performed the same type of immunoprecipitation experiment over expressing flag tag uh, mosquito MT2 in mosquito cells. And indeed, we do get an enrichment of the Simbis genome um, when we pull down flag tag MT2 compared to empty vector. But mosquito MT2 is actually serving a different role in mosquitoes than it is in fruit flies. Mosquito MT2 turns out to be proviral. We have Wolbachia infected mosquitoes in the lab and we can dissect their salivary gland tissue and after injection with Simbis show that in the presence of Wolbachia here um, on the right in red, we see decreased viral RNA. So these mosquitoes uh, do block virus. However, if we look at MT2 expression in these same tissues, we see a phenomenon that is quite the inverse of what we observe for the fruit fly. So now in the presence of uh, virus, we see increased expression of MT2, whereas Wolbachia suppresses expression of MT2. So virus and, and Wolbachia are still fighting over the expression of this same transcription hub. However, uh, it's in the opposite direction. Mosquito MT2 is proviral. So in the mosquito, Wolbachia suppresses MT2 expression and the virus increases expression of MT2. MT2 is required for virus proliferation in mosquitoes and ectopic expression of MT2 rescues virus, virus inhibition in the presence of Wolbachia. So we can again use that flag tagged MT2 construct and show this, that specific infectivity of the virus is really reduced in the presence of Wolbachia. But if we overexpress MT2, that's in the far right in black, we see a rescue of uh, specific infectivity. 
suggesting that the presence of MT2 alone, this overexpression construct, can overcome some of the Wolbachia mediated inhibition seen in these cells. And that's because virus, uh, sorry, the Wolbachia um, virus interaction in these two species is quite different. But in both cases, the virus and Wolbachia alter MT2 expression in different ways. So in the fly, we see that Wolbachia increase MT2 expression and the virus suppresses it. In the mosquito, we see that Wolbachia suppresses MT2 expression and the virus increases it. These very dramatic differences in how the MT2 is responding to virus infection led us to think about whether this gene might be um, an immune factor and might show signatures of adaptive evolution. We know that this diversification rates and also increase um, diversity of these of this of the proteins in these genes um, can be a signature of interaction between host host and pathogens. So uh, talented research associate in my lab, Dr. Danny Rice, helped us to answer this question. Um, first, what we noticed is that if you look at the structure of mosquito and Drosophila MT2, they're quite different. We see an extended N-terminal domain here in the mosquitoes that is not seen in melanogaster. And we see this extended target of recognition domain in melanogaster that's not seen in the mosquitoes. We ran several tests looking for positive selection, looking for evidence of adaptive evolution in these DNMT2 families across mosquitoes, across non-mosquito dipterans, and also across the FAFRA. And what we observed was that there is evidence of positive selection across many of these lineages. And there were many sites in DNMT2 itself that were suggested to be under positive selection as well. It's also true for Drosophila MT2. So for both mosquito and for Drosophila MT2, um, we identified certain residues that might be under positive selection and therefore important potentially for interaction with at the host uh, pathogen interface for these two different animals. All right, so what we discovered then uh, in trying to identify host determinants of inhibition is this interesting gene DNMT2, this methyltransferase, that is the lone methyltransferase in dipterans, and shows evidence of positive selection and is pulled in different directions for Wolbachia and virus. But exactly um, now, how does that work, you know, and what lies ahead for the lab? The model thus far that I've presented to you is one of cell autonomous inhibition in the animal, um, and, and that leads to reduced infectivity of progeny viruses primarily related to the virion RNA itself, the genome of the RNA itself being modified in the presence of Wolbachia. Likely, MT2 interacts with this virion RNA um, in some way. This leads to inhibition of virus in the mosquito vector, leading to a decrease in the ability of the mosquito to acquire the virus and then transmit it. Uh, but the real question is, is DNMT2 methylating the Simbus virus genome? And are there other modifications in the virus genome that are important in Wolbachia-mediated inhibition? And to kind of get at how we're addressing this, I want to give you a brief background to genetic genome modifications in general and how they might be important during virus infection. So there are many proteins in the cell that are involved in this process that people refer to as writers, readers, and erasers. In our case, you can think of them as the methyltransferase. Maybe there are host and viral proteins that detect these methylation marks, and then there are demethylases that might remove them. But there are approximately 140, although many probably undiscovered, RNA modifications that could play a role here um, in the virus. So although we are focusing on these methyltransferases, uh, we recognize that there could be other modifications such as pseudouridine that could be equally important for uh, pathogen blocking. So we um, teamed up with Hani Zaher at the Washington University in St. Louis to use uh, sophisticated techniques to identify this M5C signature in the Simbus virus genome. Now remember, uh, Wolbachia presence in the mosquito cell suppresses the expression of the methyltransferase. So we reared viruses with or without 
Wolbachia. So in, the, in mosquito cells with or without Wolbachia. And we extracted the virion RNA and then subjected it to LCMS to identify different nucleotide modifications um, in the viruses. And what we observed was, as expected, the viruses that came from Wolbachia infected mosquito cells had reduced M5C signatures compared to those that came from Wolbachia free mosquito cells. And just to show you that we're not detecting modifications, differences for everything, here's the plot of M6A, and we have other plots in the, in the paper as well that you can see. And so we think that this is a specific change due to the change in methyltransferase expression because of the presence of Wolbachia. Now, what does this mean for the virus, right? You can imagine that changing the modifications in the virus genome itself can alter the ability of the virus to interact with those readers, for example, perhaps host proteins that recognize different methylations or different other modifications in the virus genome and then target that virus. It might also change how the virus folds, how the virus interacts with its own viral proteins to be able to encapsulate itself and exit the cell. Right, so um, the next steps for this project are to, are to use uh, more interesting sequencing to be able to capture where these modifications are occurring along the length of the whole genome of the virus. So we, we can take um, virions uh, and total viral RNA uh, coming from Wolbachia infected or uh, Wolbachia free cells and subject it to direct RNA sequencing. And this is a collaborative effort. Um, we've looped in Dr. Doug Rush and Dr. Julie dunning who you maybe heard of earlier as part of this series um, to identify the viral RNA modification landscape and differences between viruses coming from Wolbachia free or infected cells. And this relies on the fact that the nanopore channel uh, detects these electrical signals, um, these differences in electrical signal as it pulls that viral RNA through the channel uh, for sequencing. And so these actually come up as you know, potential errors in base calling. Um, and so this is something that our team is developing as a, as a tool to be able to identify modifications um, broadly, not just those for M5C. So we want to identify other host factors also involved in viral RNA regulation in the presence of Wolbachia. Um, for that, we're pulling down biotin labeled viral RNA and using mass spectrometry to, feel, to try to feel out what are all the host proteins that interact with this viral RNA. Perhaps we will pull out those readers, writers, and erasers. We're also very curious about these different modifications that we might see in the virus genome and when they occur during infection. So is there a change in the viral RNA modification over the course of infection? What is the importance of these modifications to the virus life cycle? And again, that's in collaboration with Julie dunning Hotop. All right, so um, I hope that I've convinced you that pathogen blocking is a cell autonomous phenomenon that results in reduced infectivity of progeny viruses and inhibition of the virus in the mosquito vector. And that this means that the mosquitoes have a hard time acquiring, uh, disseminating and transmitting the, these RNA viruses. And likely that DNMT2 is a hub of virus host Wolbachia interaction. Uh, DMT2 leads to altered M5C profiles in the virus genome, and this may regulate virus replication and infectivity. I want to thank the members of my lab, um, the current lab members and our collaborators and the former lab members that contributed to this work, especially Tamanash Bhattacharya and Amelia Lindsay, um, our sources of funding here. And with that, I will take any questions there are. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Irene. That was really great. And uh, as I was jotting down questions, uh, all I had to do was wait for a few minutes and you were beginning to answer them. All. <laughs> That's so, all good. Quite, quite funny. But uh, this question of, uh, so let, first of all, let me say uh, to the audience that uh, please chat in your questions, or if you would like, um, you can also raise your hand and we'd be happy to recognize uh, your hand and we can unmute you. You can ask your question uh, verbally as well. So either one of those modalities was perfectly acceptable and uh, and, and encouraged. So uh, yeah, so please go ahead and, and ask some questions. Uh, just to kick things off, I mean, this question of autonomy has been one of uh, something that I've been thinking about as I hear people talking about these antipathogen effects and, and so on. So, um, so I really appreciate a lot of the clarity that you added to that uh, part of uh, my lack of understanding. But I guess I'm still a little bit um, sure. puzzled by the by the autonomy issue because so that would there must be so are there cells then that are 
well, it seemed to me there, there would be cells within an organism that is infected with Wolbachia that don't in fact have Wolbachia that wouldn't get that would get infected with uh, the virus during the course of infection and they would then produce regular viruses. So I guess I'm just you know so I'm still I'm still struggling a bit with with sure. trying to understand the extent to which the autonomous nature yes. of Yes, well I guess yeah. So so I guess from, from, from my perspective yeah. um the way I think about it is whether is there is there some uh molecule, some hormone, some signal that will Wolbachia infected cells make, for example, that would protect neighboring cells? And that answer is no. Um, that's been very cleanly shown by multiple papers now. So one of Karen Johnson's papers, for example, used a transwell assay to have Wolbachia infected cells near uninfected cells, and it, they don't protect each other in that way. Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. what uh, I hope you glean from our data is that because the progeny viruses coming from Wolbachia infected cells are defective, um, it essentially does protect neighboring cells if they are uninfected, right? So you get this kind of dilution effect um, where the virions coming out are defective and therefore can't form a new infection. But you're perfectly correct in that if, you know, the mosquito uh, midgut, for example, has some Wolbachia infected cells and some uninfected cells, then when it takes up a blood meal that has a virus, the virus has an opportunity to replicate in an uninfected cell context. However, it then might encounter a Wolbachia infected cell subsequently, you know, be that in the salivary glands or in other parts of the midgut. So I think that's what we were trying to say is that re regardless of um, the most, the most extreme examples being, you know, always Wolbachia free or always Wolbachia infected, right. Um, result in this very dramatic difference in, in virus replication. The intermediate examples where you have some mix of Wolbachia infected and free populations, you still see pathogen blocking. So I think that's what makes it so robust. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I had another question. Well, there are some questions coming in, and I'll get to them in just a second. Uh, so there was just there was one observation that you made that uh, sort of puzzled me a little bit. It was sort of early on. You took uh, the um, the free uh, Synbis genome and introduced it into yeah. Uh, cells and you got no infection you know it was a straight line right across it's a flat line. line yeah yeah but but when but when those same cells were infected with a defective virus yeah they did then we got some more some, yeah yeah and so i think that comes yeah. down so, to handling yeah so i mean yeah. when we when we're extracting the rna right um and processing in that way then you invariably will damage some of that genome. And so I think it comes down to handling and also the limit of detection for that assay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, good. Well, let me get to some questions here. Let me, again, let me encourage people to ask questions. Uh, there, it was really a fascinating talk that covered a lot of ground, uh, which was really impressive. So, uh, I mean, uh, I, I learned a lot. Uh, so, okay. So, uh, Luciana Morera uh, says, I want to congratulate, uh, you know, congratulate you on this great work that Irene and your group are doing. And I feel more hopeful that distributing Wolbachia in the field will significantly contribute to the re reduction in arbovirus circulation. So yeah, just for those who, uh, so Luciano is, uh, first of all, he was one of the people that helped discover some of the, or introduce Wolbachia into Aedes aegypti and also discover some of the antiviral effects. And he's also been very involved in the World Mosquito Program and is very active in, uh, in Brazil where he's rolling out uh, that as well. So anyway, I'll let you respond to his comment if you want to respond. Oh, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I think it's true that um, because uh, Wolbachia can have this significant effect at every stage of the process um, for mosquito, uh, for the mosquito to effectively transmit it, I think it does, it is a very robust um, tool for vector control. And ours, I should say that ours was not the first group to show that specific infectivity of viruses from mosquito salivary glands um, infected with Wolbachia is reduced. So those papers uh, came out a few years prior, and it was just another kind of interesting tidbit that, you know, oh, there's something going on here. There's some way in which Wolbachia is further inhibiting uh, the, the virus um, in the context of the animal. Yeah. So great. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Michael Eckerstoffer Eckerst uh, asked a question. Thanks for a very interesting talk. Uh, you showed that the inhibitory effect is independent of host and virus species. Uh, do using different types of Wolbachia have an impact on the system, uh, i.e. 
did you test different Wolbachia strains for differential effects of host virus combinations? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, we did that. Um, I can, I don't know if I can easily go back. Can I go back? Yeah. Um, so the specific infectivity phenotype that we've been, you know, studying for a while, that is really independent of many combina of virus, independent of um host and independent of Wolbachia strain. So here's the best example for that. So um, here's in Drosophila and in mosquitoes using three different viruses. And here is three different Wolbachia strains in the same mosquitoes. So we see that, you know, pathogen blocking works and specific infectivity is reduced in the presence of Wolbachia regardless of the strain. Now, it's a very good question to ask whether these you know, this methyl transferase phenotype that we've been um, looking at, whether we have investigated that in many different backgrounds and many different viruses. I think it's not as broad as this set, but we've looked at it in WLB and WML. Um, and we've looked at it in the context of Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti and Melanogaster and with Simbus and Chick for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So again, let me, let me encourage people to ask questions. Uh, I guess I, I, I lost the thread there, although I, I, I was following what you were saying about uh, DNMT2, about methyltransferase, but I, I may have missed how you got there. I guess it was the the network analysis that you were doing. That, <laughs> yeah, so know. actually, you know, when, when one tells a story, it's not always the same as this, the way the science was done, right? So we course, write yeah, the paper, yeah. it's not the same. So the MT2 story actually came out before our large scale differential expression study. So like this work here. Um, and the MT2 study actually came out of a separate screen. And so um, my student Tomanash had been uh, doing a genetic screen of fruit flies using the deficiency kit. So these are uh, flies that have been generated with defined chromosomal ablations. And essentially you can ask for, you know, the effect of hemizygosity on any phenotype. And so we were kind of marching through the genome of these flies, um, and many of them have Wolbachia. And so he could test whether there was an effect of path on pathogen blocking for these ablations. And he did find one you know, segment of the second chromosome that was significantly different um, in the presence of Wolbachia. And that segment happened to include MT2. When, so when he found the gene responsible, um, it kind of led, led him that way. But that data we've never published. Instead, uh, we kind of went with this increase in expression because, you know, as, as is true of, of all students who get excited about the results of their screen, when they get like an interesting, you know, phenotype, then they're done. They're done with the screen. The screen is over, <laughs> right? They want to follow down that result. So he went down the MT2 um, rabbit hole instead. Um, and this interesting effect that Wolbachia infection in Melanogaster increases the expression of MT2. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I didn't, I didn't, uh, okay. So I didn't reveal it to you. I didn't reveal okay. it to you. Dave. All right. Yeah. So it was not a totally dumb question. Good. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, just sort of, you know, um, back to the, your network analysis though, and you focused on this Pratt two, which you said was involved in nucleotide metabolism, but do we know anything, do you know anything more about, you know, specifically what that gene, what that gene does? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it is, is involved in pyrimidine metabolism. And okay. so we know that purine and pyrimidine metabolism, uh, actually it's involved in purine metabolism, I lied to you, but we know that pyrimidine and purine metabolism in the fly is influenced by Wolbachia infection. And so in work that my uh, postdoc Amelia is following up on, um, she's kind of dissecting how Wolbachia alters the metabolism of nucleotides. Wolbachia is a nucle is an amino acid scavenger. So it, mm -hmm. it is going to be like taking up a lot of the host amino acids and TCA cycle intermediates and reducing the availability of those in the fly. But in return, it can supplement nucleotides for the fly. And so what that metabolic exchange means for virus, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, just that when we identified these genes as differentially expressed and that they, the network for the fly um, in the context of Wolbachia and virus, you can pull up that slide too. Um, in the network of Wolbachia and virus, it was very um, much the case that these two entities um, intersected at nucleotide metabolism. This was one locus that she could investigate here. So he, like here, 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 um, all these genes are involved in nucleotide metabolism. And so you see a lot of connections between the like ADE5, ADE3, uh, rudimentary leg, Pratt2 pug, all these loci between the uh, Symbus responsive genome or 
fly transcriptome and the Wolbachia responsive fly transcriptome. So it just suggested that there's something interesting with regards to nucleotide metabolism when it comes to the symbiosis and how it interfaces with virus. Now, exactly why that would be the case, I don't know. I can't answer that. Like uh, why it is that, you know, the uh, flux through nucleotide metabolism would matter for the virus. I don't know specific, specifically, like maybe it has something to do with modifications, maybe not, maybe it has something to do with availability of nucleotides, wherever the virus is replicating, maybe not. Um, so that's something that we need to, to figure out more about. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, the, when you were going through, of course, the question I had bef before you got to it, of course, was uh, what was the relevance of some of this work to, or how does this work map onto effects in mosquitoes? And you looked, I mean, you did look at that and it, um, with respect to uh, the, the methyl transferase. Um, but I mean, are, is there other 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 components of the response that you're seeing that have been sort of cross validated or looked at or seen in in mosquitoes that would begin to give you further confidence that the kinds of responses that you're seeing in your Drosophila system are? I would are... no. We have not done a large scale RNA seq of this type in mosquitoes. Um, that is something we could consider doing. It is much more difficult to control what we'd like. <laughs> uh, but that's not to say it's impossible. Um, and it's something that we can consider, we could consider doing for the mosquito to see if we, you know, find the same kind of interface, for example. Um, but all of the phenotypes that we have observed for pathogen blocking are the same for mosquito and for Drosophila. So um, all of the specific infectivity reduction, when in the viral life cycle we see inhibition is also the same. Um, it's also very early during the initial stages of, rep of viral genome replication um, and the you know methylation differences that we observe um, kind of bear the same fruit. The MT2 story um, is, mm -hmm. is this uh, supported in both cases. Yeah. What, how much do you think that the methylation component that you've been pulling apart <laughs> contributes to the overall overall <laughs> I think it's one part of the story it yeah. does not explain everything I'm just getting sure. trying to get a sense of how you what do you think just from your even from your gut feeling about you know to what ex, what you know how how does it weigh with other things that might be going on there um we know that it does not explain the full story because mm -hmm. in a null you don't recover you know, a hundred percent of, you don't, you don't ablate a hundred percent of pathogen blocking. Yeah. So it's not like MT2 is the end all be all. And now virus can grow just as it does in wild type without Wolbachia mm -hmm. around. Um, so there are other components that are responsible. And that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I don't believe that Wolbachia is increasing, is altering the cell in any way in order to inhibit virus. I don't, I don't <laughs> <laughs> it's not the anthropomorphized Wolbachia, but I think that all these selfish intracellular entities are just looking out for themselves. And there are ways in which it's manipulating the host for its own benefit. And if these happen to somehow have an effect on virus, and this can be something that is positive for the host, then that's great. Um, but there are many ways in which the Wolbachia infection sculpts the cellular landscape. And I think it is fascinating to think about how this kind of altered cellular environment would then affect virus. So my lab, for example, has also been um, pioneering the looking at Wolbachia secreted effectors, and we've identified Wolbachia proteins that bundle the actin cytoskeleton and that change um, the cytoskeletal landscape in general. And so these proteins uh, could be part of how Wolbachia you know, creates its own cozy niche alters vesicle trafficking, et cetera, for itself. And perhaps they, you know, impinge upon virus indirectly. Um, but there are probably, I would say, a slew of different ways that Wolbachia does it. Yeah, yeah. Do you think this has any uh, selective effects, you know, in, in terms of the evolution of the interactions between Wolbachia and, and insects? Oh, sure. Sure. I mean, it's just something this that viral effect is really, uh, a, 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 you know, a really a positive effect on, on the host. I think yeah. it depends. So, so I would say that, um, so let's say share lab has had, has shown in pretty convincing experiments that you can select for more protective 
Wolbachia in the context of a virus infection, um, that if there is a large virus pressure, then what emerges is the most protective Wolbachia of all, which is WML pop that dramatically shortens lifespan, but does protect against virus early. Um, and is the, the most protective because it's the high, most highly proliferative Wolbachia, right? Um, so that's one very extreme example, but I'm sure in the wild, it depends on the prevalence of these viral pathogens, right? And their um, kind of fitness costs for the insect. Um, whether yeah. this would be a positive effect, but I could see it being positive. In fact, maternally transmitted, so Wolbachia are primarily maternally transmitted, even though we do see lots of evidence of horizontal transfer. If you are a maternally transmitted symbiont that, you know, is targeting the reproductive tract and are primarily going through the gonads, then it behooves you to give other benefits to the host, right? It's, uh, it's for your own benefit as well, if you can increase the fitness of the host background. And I yeah. think- you know, because Brandon's it, work has also shown that CI alone cannot explain Wolbachia's prevalence. Exactly. Right. That's right. And uh, yeah, so I, I guess the, the, it begs the question in my mind to uh, how, how looking at the uh, the universe of insect pathogenic viruses, uh, how, how much how much of that universe is actually these positive stranded RNA it, viruses? A lot of them. Yeah. So there is yeah. a sampling bias. Uh, for sure, there may, the majority of insect viruses, especially insect specific viruses, are positive sense single stranded RNA viruses. Um, and so there's like a you know, problem with sampling where we just don't have many examples to be able to test. You know, this question of um, is it something about the specificity of this phenotype having something to do with the genome? It could be. Um, the examples we have now are that it, you know, primarily impacts positive sense single stranded RNA viruses. But yeah. again, since that's the majority of these insect associated viruses, um, it's hard to say without more sampling. Yeah. yeah, good. Well, I don't think we have any more questions from the audience, unfortunately. And uh, so I'm a little disappointed in our audience there. <laughs> that's all right. I think, I think I'm going to give them a, I'm going to give them a C and that's generous. So uh, in terms of the questioning, but uh, so, oh, hold on there. Fatima responded. <laughs> okay. Thanks for Tima. I'm so, very uh, involved. Thank you for the fire. Thank you for the fire you for data. very involved in an excellent talk. These are probably very naive questions. That's okay. I'm going to ask you naive questions too. Don't worry about that. Um, uh, does the mopping up of amino acids by Wolbachia specifically hamper viral replication of positive sense RNA viruses and not other virus groups as they require amino acids to start translating viral proteins? Okay. Uh, essentially, can low levels of free-floating amino acids have some kind of titration effect on positive stranded RNA viruses? Okay. And I think yeah, I, I don't think that that's the, phenot the, the mechanism by which Wolbachia is acting. And that's because, you know, these... Um, invading pathogens, they uh, co-opt translation themselves. So they will, you know, turn off cellular machinery to be able to then take advantage of all of the amino acids that they need. Um, and they, you know, it, it, their their total amount of amino acids in a, in a virus is really very small uh, compared to the viral pool that's present in the host cell. So I don't think that that's precisely the mechanism, but I can imagine other ways in which, you know, just having Wolbachia change where you have different processes happening in a cell might alter um virus replication. So um, viruses, especially these uh, Simbus virus and the alpha viruses, they form these little replication factories inside membrane um, bound organelles that are ER associated. And Wolbachia can alter um, the trafficking of membranes to the endoplasmic reticulum. And this may alter the availability of certain host proteins that the virus needs, for example. So I could see something like that being specific, but um, maybe not total amount of amino acids. Mm -hmm. or yeah. nucleotides yeah well this has been really really great irene i mean i totally learned a lot it was really fantastic and uh this question of autonomy has really been bugging me and i, I really feel great about feeling much more uh, comfortable with what's going on there so in a, in a mechanistic way that is i mean i could sense that you know there had to be a strong autonomous effect but um but you know it was really interesting to see what they were um, okay, so I'm going to sort of put things to a close here, uh, although Pratima just uh, chatted in a, an addition here. Could, could uh, DNMT2 be a great RNAi target to be carried as cargo in a gene drive? 
some. Okay. Yeah. So could some of these mechanisms that you're finding out be actually? Yeah, I mean, that, I mean, I guess that's the against... goal. We, we work. We're basic biologists, right? And so we want to understand the basic processes by which mm. um, virus Wolbachia and hosts are interacting. But if we find something that could be used by others um, as an implementation, that would be cool. Um, mm. I think the MT2 story is interesting because MT2 is likely a major immune factor. So I'm not sure what if knocked out of MT2 does for the fitness of mosquitoes in the long term. And I think that's something that would need to be explored before people consider that as um, a target. Yeah. Okay. All right. With that, I think I'll, I'm going to say thank you very much for participating in the, in the webinar series. It's been really great. It's been, I must say it's been a, well, it has been, of course, a really great uh, series of, of webinars, and I recommend that anybody who hasn't seen or heard all of them to go to the uh, to go to our website that I provided earlier to to view those. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, give a shout out. Uh, I was just looking at the, uh, the the statistics for some of the webinars we just had, and uh, Rupinder Kaur's talk has already gotten eight hundred views. Uh, nice. On yeah, so so it's been very great. It's been a great uh, a great talk, and I'm I'm sure this one's going to get a lot of views too. So it's been really good. So um, this actually is the last uh, webinar in this series, and it's also the last webinar this year in in our particular webinar program. And we will pick it up sometime early in 2023 with topics that have yet to be decided. But for those of you who are following this uh, webinar program, uh, you'll you'll get a and have registered, then we'll be in contact with you to tell you what's going to be coming up. So with that, Irene, I want to say thank you very much for, uh, you know, for participating. And uh, again, thank the audience for, I thank the audience for attending. And um, I hope everybody has uh, a great rest of the year and we'll see everybody in 2023 with new, new webinars. All right. Bye. Have a great holiday. See ya. Okay.